Hello, everyone. I've been looking forward to this conversation all year. <laughs> so our town hall topic today, as you know, focuses on how culture and inclusive leadership drive performance, um, specifically innovation. And as all of them are, these are, this will be an interactive session. We've got some wonderful experts and CEO members who are going to be taking us through their thoughts and hopes and dreams and their journey. And then we're going to open it up to everybody else so they can share theirs as well. Once again, I'd like to thank Salesforce for hosting this town hall and for being such a bright light on equality in business in general, and Cindy Robbins and spe specifically for um, Salesforce President and Chief People Officer who will be joining us in a moment. But first, um, we've asked two exceptional leaders to jumpstart the conversation who understand the world of culture and innovation intimately. Martin Reeves, senior partner with BCG, who partners with us on our Fortune 50 list, the companies that we think are most likely to achieve breakthrough growth, and Michael Bush, CEO, most beloved of um, Great Place to Work, who partners with us on the 100 Best Places to Work list, and who has delighted many of you today when you discovered that you were on the Best Places for Millennials um, to Work list, um, which published on Fortune.com this morning. So um, by virtue of coin toss, I'm going to throw to my, my new friend, Martin Reeves, and have him start us off, and to talk to us a little bit about what it is that it takes to be on the Future 50 and what you've learned about culture and innovation by virtue of your work. Thank you, Ellen. Um, so we had the great pleasure of partnering with, uh, with, with Cliff and Alan and his team um, to try to solve a little tricky analytical problem, which is how could you measure the future growth and reinvention potential of a company? So we looked at financial data, non-financial data. We filtered out all signals of current performance and we focused on option value, we did back testing, we used machine learning, and interestingly and relevant to this discussion, we have the 16 predictors, uh, we actually found that uh, four or five were extremely cultural. So let me maybe go through those from an outside in perspective. So one of them was external orientation. We can measure using natural language processing the, um, from the verbiage of companies, from your 10Ks, your investor uh, meetings and so on. We can, we can measure how you're thinking about the future. And, and guess what, uh, a long-term orientation is very distinctive and has predictive uh, value with respect to long-term growth and value creation. A second one was more interesting. Um, we had to, to give a word for it. We called it biological orientation. So um, we could distinguish between companies as to whether they had a mechanical view of the world. In other words, controlling causal relationships, driving efficiency or driving performance, or they had a more biological orientation. They were concerned with change, adaptation, co-evolution, partnership, ecosystems, and the biological orientation won out in the, uh, in the, in the long term. Um, the third one uh, is interesting, which is um, purposefulness. Um, so we can also, using natural language processing, distinguish between companies that are trying to maximize profit as an end in itself, and those where profit is an outcome from pursuit of a purpose, and uh, purposefulness, um, as, as we'd all hope and expect, actually comes out as being a clear, uh, a clear predictive signal. Um, the fourth one I mentioned was a separate piece of work, but um, it, was a, it was a stunning result. So we looked at uh, a couple of thousand companies, and we examined, there are really two big arguments for diversity, right? One of them is um, that it's a human equity issue, so we put that aside, it's an important human equity issue. But another claim is that diversity drives innovation. So we actually, actually looked at multidimensional um, diversity, um, not just um, a, a gender and ethnicity, but national background, industry background, six or seven other dimensions. And what we found was that diversity builds on other dimensions of diversity. So diversity of diversity is powerful in driving innovation as measured by the, f the product freshness ind index across, mm. across industries. But structural diversity doesn't give you the benefit alone. It has to be accompanied by enabling measures. What do we mean by that? Transparency, open debate about ideas. Um, so those were some of the cultural um, uh, dimensions that jumped out from the analysis. But perhaps I can hand over to, uh, to Michael for the, uh, the inside-out perspective. Perfect. Thank you. Michael? Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to follow Martin because he sounds so intelligent. <laughs> you know, so it just makes me seem smarter that I'm following somebody <laughs> like, like Martin. Um, here to talk from a great place to work, and I wanted to get up because I didn't want uh, Mark to be at looking at my back because he's on a couple of our lists. It's not a way to treat customers. Uh, a great place to work uh, for all, we measure six things. 
uh, to determine what is, what is a great place to work. And you have to have your employees surveyed. So a lot of times an a CEO will say, what, what does it take to be on the list? And I'll say, we have to survey your employees. And I can tell I'll never see that CEO again except by accident. <laughs> um, uh, because it's, it, it, it's no fun. It's no fun for any of us who do it. Um, but we measure six things. We measure trust, what Great Place to Work has done for over 30 years. The relationship that people have with the people that they work with and the relationship that, that they have, most importantly, with the people that they work for. So we, we measure that. We also measure the values, whether or not the values that are on the website are actually being experienced by the people in the company. We also measure the leadership effectiveness. So we look at the experience that leaders are creating for employees. And leaders are creating one of three experiences, either the drag experience, or a neutral experience, or the acceleration experience. And we look at that based on the culture's ability to innovate and adapt quickly to new ideas. So you don't have to do a lot of change management. The company will actually move because of the trust and the feeling that they have um, for their leaders. And you know, the sad fact is, of all the companies we survey, we survey 6,000 companies a year, 6 million employees a year in 58 countries. And, and so this is everything I'm saying is based on the data. Um, unfortunately, 62% of all working people work for leaders that create the drag. Mm. These are leaders that people say, he or she is a great leader, but they're not very good with people. And people don't realize that's an insane thing to say. <laughs> You know, it's kind of when I write it down and they read it, they go, that's crazy, but people say it all the time, okay? We have a lot of people in the working world working for, for people just like that. We also measure um, innovation. We call it innovation by all, with the belief that innovation no longer can be in the hands of a person or a committee or the executive team. It has to be everybody with a smartphone phone has to be contributing to your company. And leaders create that or they kill that. So it's totally dependent on the leader. It's totally an inside job. Um, and then we do maximizing human potential. So everybody who's on our list, the 100 best, the last one, uh, the bar was higher. Because you not only had to have a high trust score, you had to deal with something called maximizing human potential for the first time. Which is we looked at the difference in the work experience between men and women in the company. And if there was a huge gap, you fell down the list or off the list. And if it's close, you went up the list. So it was a bold move on our part. I almost ruined the business. Luckily, companies hung in there and did it, and, and many are, are taking pride in that fact. And then you put those five things together, and it leads to financial growth, which we track. A uh, great place to work prior to last year did not look at financial health. So we actually had companies on the list who were losing money. We don't think that's a great place to work. We think that's a bad place to work because it's about to go out of business. So we actually believe all these things have to contribute um, to the bottom line. That's it. Beautiful. Thank you. So, Cindy, Salesforce is the only company that is not only on both lists, but at the, at the top of both these lists. I feel like that's earned you the right to stand here for two minutes and say nothing and just like bask in the glow of achievement. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but instead, I was wondering what you could tell us a little bit about what you've learned about culture, or driving innovation, and if you can work in the incredible true story of how you solved the pay gap, that would be nice too. I'm happy to do all of that thank <laughs> in you, two thank minutes. You. Um, you know, I think for me, let me start with equal pay um, because that really also helped define me as an executive and as a leader at Salesforce in many ways. Um, it started about four, four and a half years ago. Um, our CEO, Mark Benioff, does these quarterly operational reviews with the top executives who own a lot of the business plan objectives for the year. And he looked around the room one day and realized there were hardly any women in the room. And he knew these women existed in the company, but we weren't doing a good job of really giving them visibility and giving them a seat at the table. So he decided to do that. And going forward, he mandated that 30% of that room going forward would be made up of women, high potential women, women that we knew were gonna elevate into big jobs in the company. I benefited from that. Um, he opened a door for me and my good friend and colleague, Leila Seiko, who's a product executive at the time. And her and I go back 20 plus years uh, in friendship. And so we got a door open for us and we got a seat at the table and our job was to stay invited to these meetings. That was our accountability. And so we did. And we both elevated about the same period of time. Um, and then we started putting our heads together around things that we wanted to do to really elevate more women in the company. Why wasn't this easier? What could we do as women executives in the company? 
So Layla and I put our heads together. Pay was one of them. Uh, a woman in the company, several layers down, also had a great idea about a women's summit at Dreamforce, and she needed Mark's sign off. And she tried to find her path to get there. And she knew Layla. Layla knew Cindy. Cindy reported to Mark. Mark was a decision maker. So she found her journey. We took that up to Mark and also parental leave and some other great programs. And so he said on pay, I think he was a little confused. He said, do we have a problem? Have we done the assessment? And I said, we haven't done the assessment. We've never done this type of assessment. But I do know we can't do it see a big dollar sign, and kind of shut the hood. We can't do that. And if we do it, we're doing this every single year. I think that's the one thing that really surprises people that I talk to. That they, I always get the question, well, why do you keep doing it? Why do you have to keep paying? And it's still a journey for us. It's, the easy part was asking him. The hard thing is actually doing it. Um, and when you're talking about 30,000 people and their pay, you have to make sure you take a thoughtful approach and you do it right. And there's always going to be rooms for some error. You're going to have a year where you acquire 14 companies, for example, and you acquire their, their technology and their people and their pay practices, and you have to incorporate that into Salesforce's pay practices. So there's a lot around that. But I do feel that also shifted us on our stance on equality because equal pay is part of the DNA of our culture now. It's part of equality. You know, Shortly after that, we hired Tony Profit, our chief equality officer, and he's done an amazing job, you know, really um, making this really, truly part of our practices and our behavior. And a lot of it is around data, right? There is power in data alone. And I've learned how to do that and how it applies to the culture. I always say Salesforce is kind of, our culture is dictated by our values, not by perks. And I firmly believe that. Beautiful. Thank you. So hang on to the mic. We have six CEO members who have um, graciously dis um, uh, volunteered to share their thoughts on their own journey. We were going to start with Neela Bushri, the CEO of Workday, back from paternity leave. Welcome. And uh, to talk a little bit about um, where, he, where this fits from his point of view, employees first, customers second, and how that drives innovation. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. Um, our story is, is very similar to Salesforce's story. Uh, 13 years ago, my co-founder and I, Dave Duffield, started, started Workday, and we started the business around a set of core values, uh, and core values define your culture. Our number one core value is employees, number two, customer. Num many companies have those reversed. I'll come back to that. Fun, we like to have fun. We tell our employees, if you're not having fun, go to one of our competitors. Uh, integrity, we like to do business the right way. Innovation. If you're, if you're hiring the right people, get out of their way. And lastly, profitability. And that was one that took a long time to get to, but we finally got there. Um, you know, that, that uh, basically turned into uh, the way we ran the business. I, I personally interviewed the first 500 employees that joined the company, and I interviewed them specifically for cultural fit. And along that way, uh, you know, we, we embraced the model of diversity and inclusion Today, half of our management team are women, and it wasn't by design. It was basically uh, because I think our culture drives the best people to the top, and in our case, that happened to be many women. Our CHRO, CIO, CFO, and CMO are all, all women. Half of my direct reports, and our new co-president is, is a woman. And it's not because we said we need to have women in these roles. It was because they were the right people for the job. Um, Coming back to that, that focus on employees, we really believe that happy employees make for happy customers. Along the way, we honestly, through all the growth, we hit a stumble. And uh, this is where my good friend Michael Bush comes in. Uh, we were doing OK on, on the Great Places to Work survey. And then one year, our ranking dropped. And that really was a gut punch and, and uh, caused us to really find out what was going on. And what we discovered was that in the past two years, half of the employees were new and half of the managers were new as well. Mm. And if we hadn't shown them how to manage at Workday with empathy, good listening skills, the right set of values, they would manage however they managed at the previous company. So the senior management team hadn't changed, but we had a new level of managers. And it's a, a, a very well-known proverb that employees join companies and they leave managers, according to you know, and Michael's data supports that completely. 
So we undertook the task of taking all of our 1,500 managers off site for three days to teach them the way that we manage, the way that we work at Workday, dealing with conflict, building teams, collaborating, really, purpose, really being purpose-driven around it. Michael was a big part of that. We celebrated the best managers in the company. We said, show us the managers that are the top 10% compared to the entire industry, not just Workday. And uh, I was worried that was going to be a, a small list, but it ended up being a, a good-sized list. The people that won those awards uh, were teary-eyed, and it was the first time we'd actually celebrated great leaders and great managers, and I saw the power of that. And since then, um, you know, our, our culture snapped back, our ratings snapped back. Uh, we ended up higher on the list, although I would say the best part of the list is not being high on the list, although that is really good as a recruiting tool. The best part is all the data you get and how you can be better. So thank you. Thank you. So just so you know, we're going in alphabetical order. All this, we love all the CEO members equally. Heather, um, Heather Brunner, Chairwoman and CEO, WP Engine, 100 million run rate, 550 employees. You're killing it with your diversity stats way outside what's happening in technology. What's working and what, how is this driving innovation? Yes, yeah, so um, hi, everyone. Uh, one of the things I would say is that I came, I've been in technology industry for 30 years, and I kind of came to the table with a lot of biases, and I think that a lot of those biases are just kind of nature of, of business and how we've grown up. I spent probably the first um, half of my career being in denial about being a woman, being told fit in, fit into the world, don't express anything about who you are, um, you know, kind of outside of work, just focus on performance. And I realized that um, particularly now as a mother of two daughters that I'm doing myself, my daughters, and all the females and my team um, a disservice by not really being authentic about who I am and, and really claiming that about what makes me different actually makes me stronger. So I think that's been kind of one realization for me. And then I think there's been some several biases that we've been talking about here already around uh, education biases, pay biases, and leadership biases that we've really been f uh, working to fight um, against kind of really um, some key areas around systemic inequality. So first around education, we've decided to open our doors wider. I talked about this earlier. We do not require a college degree for any role. And we've been working to invest in technology uh, training and, and basically processes that allow us to do more data-driven screening and evaluation of candidates for our key um, uh, entry-level roles and kind of key high-volume recruiting roles um, so that we're looking for people that have a match for the skills and capabilities and cultural fit for those roles instead of just looking at a degree or past experience. The second area around pay, so again, we are very much a equal pay for equal work workplace. We've made a commitment to that. We're measuring it, we're quantifying, we're doing market um, comps and studies, and we've really um, viewed uh, our ability for us to say, we know exactly what we think are the ranges for roles by role, by level, by geography, so that allows us to then have a no-haggle uh, kind of recruiting experience and experience for our employees. So people, and we're working to make that more transparent to our employees, so we're still on a journey on this as well, but it allows us to say we're not going to perpetuate systemic inequalities around pay just because historically a candidate who's had done better at negotiating is going to come in and then negotiate again above someone else who's not negotiating. So we were basically saying we want to move to a role, to a model where we're not asking for previous comp compensation history and going to pay pay for the role, um, again, by role, by level, by geography, consistently. And then we pay for performance. And so then once you're in, equal playing field, and then we're going to keep the bar high around performance, and the, and the best performers are going to get the best compensation and rewards. And then lastly, around leadership. Um, leadership, I think we all need to rethink what a leader looks like. Leadership is not position. Leadership is action. Anyone in your organization can be a leader. When you enable them, you teach them. We practice open book management. We teach all of our employees, no matter what level you are, the key KPIs of our organization, how to read um, our financial statements, and then we talk to our team about it, our results. Ex when they happen two weeks after we close the books, we tell the entire organization, so we're teaching them about how to be business owners, how to think like leaders, and again, at every level of the organization, you see that level of commitment and ownership to being part of the company. So again, I would think, you know, us kind of challenge us, rethink your biases around, around hiring and, and access around education, rethink around pay, and rethink around leadership. Thank you. Thank you. 
Kathy Engelbert, CEO of Deloitte. Last time I talked to you about this, which now feels like forever ago, I said, listening to you talk about the way you think about culture and courage and innovation and risk taking was like listening, watching a three dimensional chess master, which is not something I've ever actually seen, but I would believe it would be, you would be great at it if I did. <laughs> Bring us up to date on, 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 on how you've been developing. I know you've changed some things with your resource groups and what ideas are coming out of your uh, leadership philosophy. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to address the group. And as Ellen referred to this culture of courage, so a couple years ago, pre Time's Up, pre Me Too, pre -administ new administration, um, we launched something that we did call the culture of courage and we spent a whole day brainstorming. How should we define it? And after the whole day when my head was spinning, I said, you know what? We're not actually going to define it because, and I'm glad now we didn't, we had no idea what we would be faced with, but the reason why we didn't define it, we said some people will, will define it as a culture of courage around uh, inclusion. Some will do it around feeling entrepreneurial. Some will do it around feeling innovative. Some will do it in whatever they have a passion for. And so if we're really going to foster a more inclusive environment, Let's not define it, let's foster to have courageous conversations. Little did we know the period we would go into, and it's been a huge lift. We're 73% millennial now. It's been a huge lift to just have the conversations, and we've signed all the pledges, and we have all the best programs, I think, around inclusion. This has made the biggest difference, I think. Our people feel like they can have these conversations. Our people are not necessarily identifying with a co one cohort group anymore. They want to have these conversations across a diverse set of uh, ideas, a diverse set of people. Um, so that was why we launched last year to some controversy, something called inclusion councils. And of course, you know, one media reported said, oh, Deloitte doing away with their BRGs, you know, and doing away with diversity. We're, we're actually double downing on that through these inclusion councils, which aren't just one cohort group. We still have our BRG, ERGs. This is actually to get everybody in a room talking about this, whatever courageous conversations they want to have to drive inclusion and to make sure people feel more included. Our uh, attendance at these have tri over tripled. I'm probably understating it. Uh, and it's been a huge hit with our people who, whether you're from our LGBT community, whether you're from our underrepresented minority communities, women, um, veterans, they actually now are all getting together to have these very tough conversation about our divisive world instead of just in their cohort group. So been a, a big hit, but all anchored in uh, courageous conversations. Thank you. One. Okay, Mark Hoplamazian, President and CEO of Hyatt. I was really moved by your um, earlier remarks, your philosophy on customer care. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that translates into leadership and employees and, and where new ideas are coming from from you. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, first of all, thanks to Fortune uh, for doing this. And I want to thank all of you because we all are uh, pressed for time and we have a lot of choices as to where we could spend our time. So the fact that there are so many senior executives from great companies here trying to elevate what we can do to really care for our own people in a more significant way and elevate engagement is really encouraging um, and inspirational. So thanks to all of you. Um, <clears throat> so um, you might have heard this old adage in the hotel business, which uh, goes something like, it's all about location, location, location. Um, our chairman, Tom Pritzker, coined a phrase years ago, which was, it's actually all about people, people, and people. Um, and so as I think about um, what we're faced with in our business, uh, we see a consumer who's increasingly focused on experiences over material objects, over things, um, which is great for travel. That's inherently, we're inherently experiential. The question is, what are colleagues looking for? And increasingly, they're looking for flexibility. They're looking in their, in their work lives. They're looking for being able to bring their whole selves to what they do and find authentic relationships with others who are bringing their whole selves to what they do. Um, and I think the final thing is uh, fulfillment. They're looking for fulfillment in what, in what they uh, find at work, not just at home. And for us, that's really been a focus on our purpose journey. Um, really focusing on a single purpose at Hyatt, which is to care for people so they can be their best, and really uh, focusing on a culture that has as its number one capacity the practice of empathy. Um, I was given great advice by a mentor at one point, which is we have two ears and one mouth, and you should use them in that proportion. Um, so empathy begins with intensive listening. And as we've applied ourselves to that, 
um, we've really applied it through the lens of design thinking to identify ways in which we can really help to enhance the culture and the workplace environment. So um, we've we focused on developing a leadership, a set of leader, leadership expectations around uh, some attributes that are maybe a little atypical. So our five attributes are care, serve, to serve colleagues that you're working with, to learn, learn about yourself, to adapt, and to achieve. So a little atypical. You may not find those in the leadership capacities in many companies. But then we've taken that to really apply how that shows up and how we can support that uh, with our colleagues. We've turned to technology. Uh, a couple of specific examples. We've put scheduling into the hands of a number of our colleagues, including housekeeping, which is our most, uh, the, the highest headcount, so to speak, in, in hotels is housekeeping. Allowing housekeepers to self-schedule through a mobile app has been a huge unlock in their ability to manage their lives. We also created a platform uh, for our guest-facing colleagues. There's nothing worse than, as a guest than to stare at the top of the head of the person who's staring at a screen tip tapping away, 150 keystrokes to get you checked in. And so we actually created um, a layer of technology to allow people to actually be looking up, making eye contact, and with three touches of a screen to be able to check you in instead of the 150 keystrokes. That was really driven by a colleague experience that we were trying to achieve, which ultimately led to a guest experience, which is really the, the wonderful sort of uh, combination. We did some other things like uh, increased our family leave policy creating more flexibility ab around how um, our family family members can actually engage with their families. Um, and um, we designed a new headquarters recently, really focused around diversity of types of environments that people can actually elect to work in, So, um, which has really led to uh, a tremendous level of uh, engagement and interaction. The final thing that we did is we committed ourselves to trying to bring opportunities to those who don't have them in a lot of the underserved communities in which we operate. So we had a panel this morning of a number of people who were actually focused on this very topic on the skills gap. And having that level of focus in how we can actually fulfill our purpose in helping to provide opportunities to others has been really inspirational for a lot of our own colleagues. So it's a combination of those kinds of things that I think have led to, um, uh, what, to some real progress in getting people to a higher level of engagement. Thank you. Margaret Keene, President and CEO of Synchrony. Um, we're about four years out from your IPO? That's at four years out, yes. yes. So I was really struck by how intentional you were about thinking about culture from the moment it was fully an independent, um, you were a fully independent company from GE. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and specifically what it's done for new products and development and, and your sure. bottom line business. Sure. So, you know, we had the luxury of coming out of a company that had a very strong culture. So one of the things we had to really think about coming out of GE is who did we want to be? So in September, right after the IPO, I brought my team together and we engaged with the Purpose Institute to really first create our purpose. And I must tell you, when I first did this with my leadership team, they were all like, Margaret, we're really, really busy. Like, what do, we, what do you mean culture? And I'm like, nope, we're all gonna go. And we spent you know, a week in a room really talking about the future of the company. Who, do, who did we want to be as a company? And we worked on the purpose and the values. And I'm not gonna list all my values, but I'd say two things about the values. One of the things we talked about is the value of all our employees. We have a very big call center population. They talk to our customers every single day. So one of our values is caring, and that caring value goes not only to our, our customers, but also goes to our employees, and that's a big part of the culture and how we've built this. The second is we wanted a value that <clears throat> was forward thinking and uh, wanted to encourage innovation and technology and, and, and being forward thinking. So we have a value of bold, which we call actually one of our more aspirational values because to get the company to be a risk taker, to really think about innovation and, and driving technology going forward was gonna be a very different thing in terms of who we were as a standalone company. So flash forward where we made the list of 44 this year and great places to work, but I, I think the other piece of this was really creating a culture that really drove diversity and inclusion. And if you do any studies on innovation, 
what, what it'll tell you is the more diverse the team is that's working on that innovation, the more sustainable that innovation is going to be, and the better that innovation getting all those ideas. So we've created these teams where the teams are diverse. We make sure that they're a mix of people from all walks of life. Um, it's, it's embedded in how we're driving innovation and technology in the company. And I would tell you that <clears throat> we are fast forward on being what I think a more forward thinking company and driving technology. And then the last thing I'd hit on is we have a number of diverse networks, uh, but one of the ones that I'm most proud of is we created a people with disabilities network. And we have now over 300 people who work at Synchrony who have disabilities. And I will tell you, um, when you talk to these individuals and you listen to their stories, where they feel like they have a purpose to get up every single morning and come to work and to contri contribute to society, it will bring a tear to anyone's uh, eyes. It's one of the things I'm really most proud of as a company to really make a difference in, in that community. Thank you. So we've worked our, we worked our way to the end of the alphabet, and Patrick, Patrick Quinlan, I, I've lost you. Are you here? How, there you are. Hi. Hi, CEO, co-founder of uh, Conversant. I, and you are growing rapidly. You are our ethics guru here. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you've learned about building um, a, a, a culture that's moving this fast, that is still innovative, and what it means for your customers as well. Well, I think the one thing I know I need to learn, and Neil, I'm going to come track you down. Um, I'm about to have, we are about to have our second kid. I didn't take paternity leave the first what? time. I didn't. I didn't do it. I took like one day. And I got lectured by my team that I have to do it this time. So whatever you did, I need to get your advice. I saw you over there. I think on, he made it a mandate that people take paternity leave and well, you should do yeah, that Yeah, I did too. the same thing. I just didn't follow the rules, which is the uh, irony of an ethics CEO, that's right? That's um, so my name is Patrick Quinlan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Conversant. We're a five-year-old, somewhere between startup and growth company um, that has built the world's first ethics cloud. Um, so our customers are really global 2,000 companies um, that have a focus and want to understand the ethical health of their organization. So if you think about um, really the last 18 months and what surrounded so many of these conversations, um, here over the last 24 hours is 2017 was really a year of reckoning inside this ethical transformation that's happening uh, inside the corporate business community. And 2018 is a year where you're going from that reckoning to you have to really be able to show how ethics is being embedded inside the organization. And in doing that, when we started the company five years ago, we wanted to give executives and boards and leaders inside the organization the ability to measure and monitor ethics in the same way that you do financial performance and sales performance, et cetera. And much as we heard from Michael that a lot of that conversation they do, they do through surveys, we do it through really looking at the thousands of transactions that happen inside an organization, um, whether that be inbound or outbound communication, and really learning and using sophisticated uh, technology to be able to understand are the words and thoughts of the CEO and are the aspirations of what an organization um, is trying to be, is that consistent in the behaviors of the individuals inside the organization? And in building a company that literally lives and breathes every day, um, helping our customers manage ethics, um, we obviously have to operate internally at a very high level. So we've got about 150 team members uh, in the US and in London. And uh, as a co-founder, I was one of the individuals that wrote, um, uh, I was the individual that wrote our values. And I won't take you through all of them, but there was an interesting learning lesson I got from one of those values. So I started, um, uh, I came out of the military. Um, I served in the Army during Desert Storm many, many years ago. And there was something about the idea of being uncomfortable that um, my uh, sergeant over my squad beat into my head that the more uncomfortable I am, the happier he was. And, um, and that always stuck with me, and I learned a lot of character from that uh, Sergeant Brown. And so one of our values that I wrote was uncomfortable, um, being comfortable with pushing ourselves, uh, like we heard from John this morning, how do you only get to 70%, and that feels like a real win. And in writing that, I thought it was this you know, great genius CEO moment, and this was going to push us forward as a company. And about 18 months in, I realized that it was actually creating the exact opposite effect that this rule that I had, this, this guide that I had tried to put in to push all of us to be better, actually sometimes in those moments of frustration of building a global software company, 
could actually be used as much as a weapon as it was a crutch. And there were times where conversations were going too far and, and, and emotions were coming out and people were using this idea of, but I thought that's what we were supposed to do. Um, and it was one of those moments um, where you realized that the importance of the messaging and how consistent you are in your own actions as a CEO and driving that through the organization really has an impact. I think we've corrected that. We now use it um, appropriately. But um, it, it, is, it is interesting how the values of the organization, if you're not careful and if you don't steer that really closely, can sometimes go a lane over and, you know, like many things in a company as the CEO, you're the last one to actually realize that you're one lane off where you intended to be. So, but again, our noble cause is to combine ethics and business performance together. We know that um, uh, companies with great ethical performance outperform their peers, and it's something we're extraordinarily passionate about. So thank you. Okay, so the time is, is now here to open it up. If you um, have a question or a comment or um, a concern or a hope or dream, uh, put up your hands. The mic runner will come to you or me if you're close by. Um, say your name and shout it out to the universe. But while we're um, scanning, looking for folks who want to weigh in, I wanted to um, dig in on a couple of things that came up in our conversation. And one is really specifically the link between the hard work you're doing on culture and new ideas. You know, and what are you seeing? And specifically, where is it? Where are you investing? Where are you taking risks? Dollar amounts are always helpful. <laughs> um, but anybody who can weigh in on something that's really worked or something that, that maybe you have abandoned. So sure. Um, so we're going to spend about a billion dollars this year on training and culture within Accenture. Um, so my name's Mike Sutcliffe, I'm with Accenture. Um, and I, we grew up in a firm where the culture was strong, right? It's been, it's been strong for 30 years. And we thought that was a real strength for the company until we decided we needed to have different capabilities, expand our scope of services, and do different things. And then we found out that what we really needed was a culture of cultures. And that was hard for us because we all grew up with the same training, the same values, the same expectations, and it was such a strong environment that it was very hard to then say, well, actually, now we're going to bring in a different group of people with different DNA, different way of working, and allow that to be OK, not to ask them to transform to our culture, but to change our culture to be open to the fact that there's strength in having a culture of cultures. And so that's actually how we talk about it inside the firm. We haven't changed our values. So before we make an acquisition or we hire somebody into the firm, we start with the values. What are we trying to achieve? And how do we expect people to behave? But as long as we have a values match, we're actually much more comfortable now with the fact that people can come from lots of different backgrounds and different cultures. Now, we created Accenture Digital we were going to expand our footprint. So we needed data scientists. We needed creative artists. We needed people that just hadn't been part of our workforce at scale before. And if you put a creative artist and a data scientist in the room together, they're probably going to dress differently, look, you know, talk differently, and think differently about how to go after a problem set, which is exactly what we want. right? So what we said earlier about the diversity of not just gender diversity or geographic diversity or educational diversity, but all types of diversity um, allows us to be more creative. And it has worked at an incredible pace. And so what's been interesting to us is to see how rapidly the teams that grew up in this very strong single culture firm have adapted to the concept of a culture of cultures being a much stronger firm. And so that's what we're working through right now. Um, and what we're finding is every time we bring in a new group that has a different culture and we don't ask them to change, but we watch what they do and we try and learn from it, we find that there's a strength there that we can then use across the rest of the company. So that's one of the things that we're working through. Very good. Thank you. So I'm Marjorie Krauss. And, um, I wish we had a billion dollars for training. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I represent a different category, maybe, of uh, by scale and uh, size. 
but I thought it might be interesting uh, to take one example of what we've done to build culture. Our company is about 35 years old um, this year, well, starting in January, and um, we are, uh, we've built this all organically, but we've built it across 30 markets uh, globally. And one of the things we did to um, deal with the fact that we have more than 50 nationalities is we started a program uh, for the rising stars, for the uh, junior and mid-level, where um, they can apply and spend uh, three weeks in any other office. Um, and we did homestays to start, which was kind of interesting because it's a cultural experience, especially for younger people. And then we gave stipends to the staff so that they could use that to take people for cultural experiences, ball games, theater, something like that. And uh, it ended up being a very uh, good way to solidify uh, people across geographies because you, not, you became uh, personally engaged in the other culture. And when you're working on teams across these boundaries, it meant that you, um, you did it not only with respect for the other culture, but you kind of became an advocate. So if you're sitting in Washington working on a global project and you needed somebody in Beijing to help you, um, you, you didn't feel strange, and you also told your other colleagues in your home office that there's talent there that you should draw on. And it just created this interesting dynamic, which now we don't do homestays anymore, um, but we continued the program. And probably in any given year, there's somewhere between 5 and 10% of the younger people in the company that get to take advantage. And then as they grow up in the company, it really does help solidify the culture. And it's not expensive. <laughs> Tony, would you like to share? Sure. You know, at, at Salesforce, uh, one of the mainstays of our culture have been our employee resource groups. Yeah. And uh, up until about a year ago, we had nine. And you know, it's all about being your full authentic self at work. And so there'd be an employee resource group, for example, for the, the blacks at Salesforce. Both fours. And so folks came into work and they'd say, well, like Tony, you identify as a black, cisgendered, heterosexual man. That's your identity. What if my identity, core to my identity, is, is my faith? Mm -hmm. Can I be my full authentic self at work? If you did that litany and your faith was in those top two or three aspects of how you identify yourself. And so the answer unequivocally, it, it has to be yes. That you, know, you, you, you have to be able to be your full authentic self at work. And so we took. We began to experiment in saying we're going to form an interfaith employee resource group, and you know, two courageous leaders, a Christian man and an Islamic woman, got together and they found common ground, and they founded Faith Force, which was our tenth employee resource group, and it's actually the fastest growing, and we've seen a tremendous amount of uh, uh, pent-up demand that was obviously there, and a lot of interest from folks uh, outside the company on how you can do this in a way where it's unifying and, and not divisive. Mm. So that's one of the things just in the last 12 months that we've been working to, to blaze a trail and push the frontier a bit. So we, we only have a couple of minutes left, and I, I wanted to sort of check back in with our conversation partners here, Michael and Martin, about measurement. Because so much of this is a call to action. We're, we're experimenting with culture. We're exper experimenting with culture authentic, uh, authentically. Authentic that word I can't say right now. Um, and what do you measure? And, and what have you learned about um, what people should be looking for as they think about driving, um, driving culture change and innovation? Um, Michael, can I start with you? Uh, sure. Um, our survey asks 58 questions, the same 58 questions all around the world. And then there's an additional five or six that people tailor because countries are different. And what you can ask in certain countries are different. So we take that data and um, have a software tool that analyzes that data that lets us know what's going on in the culture. So really what we are measuring is leadership. Okay. That's what we're measuring. Uh, but if you say that, I'd have no business. Okay, <laughs> but um, that, that is what we are measuring. Uh, and so what, what you can do is you can look at the, the employee experience and you will see what's happening. And it's normally tied to a leader. Um, that's creating this in a horrible, like really tough work. You know, we, do, we survey mines uh, where people are making $2 a day in Bogota, Colombia. That, that we do that, that work as well. And someone will say, this is a great place to work. And they'll talk about their leader. 
th this person who goes and gets them water and things like that in a very tough situation. So it's all about that person that, that people work for. As well as you can find another company where everybody's making a ton of dough and they will say, this is a horrible place to work. Okay, the gold plated, only drinking water with bubbles in it, and this is a horrible place to work. <laughs> all because of that person that they work for. So that, that's, what we're, that's what we do. Um, the numbers are about leadership and you can see the picture. You can absolutely see the picture, and um, and then we give that to leaders who take a look at it and decide what they want to do. And uh, the tough situation is that case. We call it the unintentional leader. That's the most positive way we can describe certain leaders. Yeah. It's like an accident that they became a leader, okay? But they are a leader, and then but they're also usually an outstanding individual performer. That's the tricky part. I know. And we promoted them yeah. because it's the only way to get them more money. Right. And it's done, it's done all the time. And so then the leader has to take a look at that. And some leaders have, we just heard about courageous leadership. Yeah. They have the courage to say, look, you got to work on this. You, you've got to be great in this people area as well. But um, we the, measure the leaders. With 30 seconds left, can you just leave us with a, an inspiring moment to go forward with? I'm not so sure about that. But um, I'll, I'll build on something that, that Margaret said, um, which is what came to mind when I listened to what Margaret said. Um, the thing that came to mind for me was, she said, look, when you wake up. And when I get in the shower, I can't wait to get on with my day. I am so fired up. I, I'm in there, I should be thinking about taking a shower, but I'm thinking about what <laughs> I'm gonna do. Okay, like everybody in here, we are totally fired up to do, and we bring 150% to, to, to what we do. Everybody should be having that experience. That's what we mean by great place to work for all. But the facts are these, it's not happening. It's not happening. Uh, Bloomberg just did a survey, 1,600 uh, people, 1,612 people identified as lesbian, gay, uh, transgender, uh, bisexual, or queer, and half of them said they tell no one at work. They're closeted to half their people. That's that. We have 11% of the working population that someone in their family is disabled. 62% of those people tell no one at work mm -hmm. that they, are, they have somebody in their family who is disabled. Right. We call them the invisible 11%. This is what's happening, and people don't do that because they're crazy. They do it because they're smart. Yeah. They know if they reveal certain things about themselves, their career trajectory will change. And unfortunately, generally speaking, they're right. The for all leader, the leaders in here, the leaders we all wanna be, you gotta be creating an environment where people can be themselves, where they can bring their full selves to work because you're paying them, you're giving them benefits, why not get all of them? You know, why get 70% of them? I know it's more than 30 seconds, but anyway, that's the thing. No, okay? you're good. <laughs>